Yeah, it has really given us a lot of illumination already. <laughs> we had gone beyond the void. Death is no more there. Therefore, of course, there is no more falsehood also because it is death who is the cause of falsehood. So if death has gone away, automatically with that falsehood also goes away. The error with which we were looking at things, that error has been removed. And therefore, we see the meaning, the significance, the purpose, a kind of a whole design behind this creation in the light of the Supreme, which shall illumine us with the truth. Savitri is in the transcendent, and as I have been saying all along, Savitri has gone into the transcendent through the void. What does that really mean? There are two things in that. <clears throat> the first thing is, behind the void, after all, it is the Supreme Himself. It is his creation, it is his transcendence. What you are seeing as a face in the form of a void is not really that. Behind the void is the Supreme with a certain purpose. Therefore, she has gone directly, seen the void, seen behind the void, the Supreme Himself directly. It is the Supreme who is supporting, who is holding, who is maintaining, keeping it for a certain purpose the void. So going behind the void is something which is remarkable to see the meaning, the content of it. You don't see from, from this side, you see from behind what is the content and meaning of the void, you see. The other thing is, we have seen earlier at the end of the last canto that death has vanished into the void from which he came, from the void from which he came. 147.37. The dire universal shadow disappeared, vanishing into the void from which it came. The shadow had disappeared. figure of death, which is the shadow of the Supreme, it is that shadow which has disappeared. So what you really see, the moment the shadow has disappeared in that, you really see the Supreme Himself in His truth form. You see the Supreme Himself in His truth form. Now, the other puzzling thing is, vanishing into the void from which it came. All right? Death has vanished, he has vanished into the void. Does it mean that the void also has disappeared? No. It does not mean the void is there. The void is there. So what about that void? What happens to that void now in the absence of death there? Does it serve any purpose? Is there any substance, content in the existence of that void now there? Well, that is a difficult question. But I think the answer to that lies in what we are now doing. What has happened is the shadow has disappeared, the void has disappeared. Our way of looking at things, that error, it is that which has been removed. So what we should really see is, is not the void, but the Supreme Himself in the non-manifest content, in the non-manifest state. 
and because it is in the non-manifest state, you may call it, if you like, a void. And it is out of it, now the manifestation will come out. Now the grace of this non-manifest existence of the Supreme is what is now being described in this canto here. And Savitri, for the first, first Savitri sees first the seven immortal earths climbing one above the other. And we are still looking at this description of the earth which is closest to our physical earth. The harmony, the beauty, the joy of various planes of consciousness which are there, it is those which she is seeing here now. In the harmony of an original sight, now it is that original sight now which is going to give to us some idea of what it is there for original sight. Delivered from our limiting ray of thought and the reluctance of our blinded hearts to embrace the Godhead in whatever guise she saw all nature marvelous without fault. She, of course, stands for Savitri. All nature, so everything. Now, so the error has disappeared. Original sight is what is giving her now the true vision of things, which our blinded hearts do not see and perceive. The Godhead has put on a guise and we are not able to see behind his guise what he is there for, you see. She saw all nature, the whole creation, the whole manifestation, the whole activity, without fault, perfection. It is all perfection. Perfection of what? A few things are described here. Invaded by beauties, universal revel, the joy of beauty everywhere. Her being's fiber reached out vibrating and claimed deep union with its outer selves. So the inner and outer, that division, that dichotomy, that conflict, that has disappeared. And on hearts cause made pure to seize all tones, heavens, subtleties of touch unbearing foes, more vivid raptures than earth's life can bear. What would be suffering here was fiery bliss. There, of course. <laughs> yeah. So, naturally, what we have been crying and weeping and shouting all about, it is nothing for him. For him, it's all bliss, fiery bliss, you see. It is, it is our error, our ignorance, our limitation, which make us weep and cry and all that. But behind that, day, there is the kind of intensity of joy, of expression in some other manner. That we don't feel in expression. All here, but passionate hint and mystic shade, divine by the inner prophet who perceives, he perceives, inner prophet, he perceives the spirit of delight in sensuous thing turned to more sweetness than can now be dreamed. So it's a constant growing of sweetness and joy and happiness. The mighty signs of which earth fears the stress. Yeah, you see, earth cannot fear the stress, the impact, the force of it, trembling because she cannot understand and must keep obscure in form strange and sublime. Were here the first lexicon of an infinite mind, translating the language of eternal bliss. Each object, each expression is a word expressing bliss, eternal bliss. And each object therefore is forming a dictionary, a lexicon. Each object is a dictionary, is a meaning. Each object has a meaning contained, a dictionary, of the infinite mind. Here, rapture was a common incident. 
the loveliness of whose captured thrill our human pleasure is a fallen thread. Lay symbol shape, a careless ornament shown on the rich brocade of Godhead's dress. So what to imagine you see? <laughs> so he's imagining the Godhead wearing beautiful embroidered clothes and on that is what is happening. Loveliness of whose captured thrill, our human pleasure is a foreign thread. So that thread of the embroidery is their thread. Lay similar shapes, a careless ornament, shown on the rich brocade of Godhead's dress. Things fashioned were the imaged homes where mind arrived to fathom the deep physical joy. The heart was the torch lit from infinity. The limb were trembling densities of soul. Now this is what has to happen. The heart, a torch lit from infinity. <laughs> now that is what has happened. A heart has been lit like a torch from infinity. Infinity is torch. The limbs. See, this, this is because he's talking about now nature, no? All nature. So this is the description of the expression of the joy everywhere in every part. Things fashioned were the image homes where mind arrived to fathom, to fathom a deep physical joy. The heart was a torch lit from infinity. The limbs were trembling density of soul. So it is not the subtle form alone, it is the kind of a physical concreteness which is there everywhere. See. These were the first domains, the outer courts, immense but least in range and least in price, the slightest ecstasies of the undying gods. So you see, now you can imagine what will be beyond that. <laughs> you see, we can't even imagine that. These were the first domains, you see. He's, he's climbing up one above the other, you see, Savitri. Higher her swing of vision, swift and new, appetite to last sapphire opening gain, end to wideness of a light beyond. These were but sumptuous decorated doors to worlds nobler, more felicitously here. So you have got now regions beyond regions, beyond regions, beyond regions. You have got a kind of a remote glimpse of this in Book of Job. In the Bible, you see, the good job. He describes various floors of various stones of various clay, various gates, and things like that. Yes. In the book of Job, you have got a little glimpse of it there, you see. Jasper, amethyst, various layers of planes are there, and gates also there. I think I sent you that message in material sometime. Higher has swing of visions, it new. Admitted through last sapphire opening into the whiteness of a light beyond. These were but some few decorated doors. See, this is this, this word door, gate, that is from Book of Job. The world's nobler, more felicitously fair. Endless aspired the climbing of those heavens, realm upon realm, received her soaring view. I of course, stands for Savitri. She's climbing up now and beyond. So this is the richness of the void. Now, this is the richness of the void, you see. <laughs> then, on what saying, one crown of the ascent, we are finite and the infinite are one, immune, she behaved strong, immortal to seen who live for a celestial joy and rule, the middle region of the unfading ray. So these are still middle regions, you see. <laughs> they are still middle regions, you see. 
So beyond that, beyond that, I, we can't say what kind of felicity is, what kind of beauty is, you see. And these are the places where the immortals live. She behaved strong immortal seeds. Those who have done tapasya and acquired immortality, they go and live there. Gods and rishis or sages who live for the celestial joy and rule, the middle region to the unfading rain. Great forms of deities sat in deathless tears. Eyes of an unborn gaze towards her lane through a transparency of crystal fire. So they are looking at her now. Savit is climbing up, you see. Eyes of an unborn gaze towards her lane through a transparency of crystal fire. So the fire is there, crystal bright, luminous. And through that fire, they are looking at her, you see, the crystal fire. A diamond is burning there constantly. The fire of the diamond, the fire of topaz. See, these are the, uh, these are the stones which are used in the Book of Job, topaz, topaz walls. These are topaz walls. In the beauty, your body is wrought from rapturous line. Shades of entrancing sweetness, stilling bliss. Feet glimmering upon the sunstone course of mine. Heaven's cupbearers were round eternal wine. A tangle of bright body. So there are people carrying wine now and serving you there. See, did you <laughs> see? Eternal wine. A tangle of bright bodies of moved soul, tracing the close and intertwined delight, the harmonious trade of lies forever joined, the passionate oneness of a mystic joy, as if sunbeams made living and divine. So these are the sunbeams who have become living and divine there now. The golden bosom of Sarah goddesses. In groves flooded from an argent disk of blisk that floated through a luminous sapphire dream. In a cloud of raiment lit with golden limb and gleaming footfall steading fairy swarm, virgin motion of beckoned innocences who know the right for a dance of God, world linked in moonlit ribbon to the heart. So these are the even Swarga, what we call in Hindi, Swarga, where you got Apsaras and minstrels and dancers and musicians, all the while. So you are in the company there, you see. <laughs> well, that is what uh, even, even the uh, Abrahamic traditions also speak of the beautiful things which are present after death, you see. Virgin motions of beckoned innocences who know the right for a dance of God, world linked in moonlit revels to the heart. Impeccable artists of unerring forms, magician builders of sound and rhythmic words, wind haired Gandharvas chanted to the ear, Gandharvas, heavenly minstrels who sing songs. Gandharvas chanted the ear, the oaths that shaped the universal thought. So when they say the universal thoughts get formed because of them. Oaths that shape the universal thought, the lines that tear the veil from deity's pain, the rhythm that bring the sound to wisdom to see. See the rhythm that brings the sounds of wisdom to see. What a powerful line this one is seeing. Perfect I am it. The rhythm that brings the sounds of wisdom to 
you see perfect iambic line you see almost monosyllabic the line that tear the veil from deity's face so the veil is removed by those things you see and you see the deity himself grand haired gandharva so that is how the gandharvas the heavenly beasts in the course of indra they are depicted normally they are here flying like that like manes chanted the ear the oh the shape the universal thought now this word gandharva the way it is spelled here belongs to the old style of spelling by shivendra g u n d u later on he would change that name to g a n d h a gandharva 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 chanted the see there is a difference between that why he is put like that gandharva gandharva well gandharva gandharva chanted the ear that is how you will read gandharva gandharva chanted the ear in the modern spelling in the later spelling he would say gandharva gandharva chanted the ear that is more sanskritic gandharva gandharva has a kind of a softness of tone gandharva gundharva you see i mean <laughs> so uh, uh, he wanted to bring that kind of a softness in the expression by using this spelling gandharva see earlier he used to say satyavan sutyavan savitri tejarai to bring the softness into english pronunciation not the uh, not the kind of a harshness which is there solid with the in the sense of savitri savitri is i mean <laughs> that so he he had adapted this by putting the spellings like that durga all this is gundharva wind hand gundharva chanted the year. so when you are reading this thing you should read this thing like really gundharva not gandharva wind hand gundharva chanted the year the oh the shade the universal thorn the line that tear the veil from same thing to also for ashwapati you see in the sanskrit spelling would be a s h w a t i ashwa p a t i ashwapati later he had made p a t h y pathi to make it kind of soft immortal figures and illumined brows our great forefathers in those splendors mood lucky people <laughs> they mood there but they have left us here immortal figures and illumined brow our great forefathers in those splendors of moon timeless power and satisfied of light they enjoy the sense of all for which we strive who are these great forefathers high seers mood poets saw the eternal thoughts that travelers from on high arrive to us so eternal thoughts are travelers who arrive on us from high eternal thoughts are travelers from on high who arrive to us deformed but they get deformed when they come to us tricked by costuming mind like gods disfigured by the pangs of birth <laughs> when god takes the mortal birth he has to suffer the lot of mortality like gods 
disregard by the pangs of birth. When the divine Savitri to the mortal birth as human Savitri, she of course suffered the pangs of birth. She has to pass the portal of birth that is a death she has suffered. But then, was she disfigured? <laughs> she has to. Her heavenly form, her heavenly beauty, her heavenly body has to take the mortal body or the physical. She has to. By difficult rapture on a mortal tongue, the strong who stumble in sin were calm, proud gods. They are lightning filled with glory and with flame, melting in waves of sympathy and sight, smitten like a lyre that throws to others' bliss, a lyre that throws to others' bliss, not to its own. Drawn with the cause of ecstasies unknown, her human nature went to heaven's delight. She beheld the class to earth denied and born. The imperishable eyes of veilless love more climbed above, level to level reach, beyond what tongue can utter or mind dream. Worlds of an infinite reach crowned nature's sister. So he is still describing one about the other. You see. There was a greater tranquil sweetness there. This is something rare. There can be sweetness, but there has to be the tranquility also. Then it will become sweeter, more sweet. When it is calm, then it becomes really sweeter also. There was a greater tranquil sweetness there, a subtler and profounder ether spirit and mightier scheme than heavenly sense can give. Their breath carried a stream of seeing mind. Form was a sensuous raiment of the soul. Color was a visible tone of ecstasy. Shapes seen half immaterial by the gaze and yet voluptuously palpable made sensible to touch the indwelling spirit. The kind of a concreteness now, the experience is being described here. Stream of seeing mind. We don't have the seeing mind at all. Made sensible to touch the indwelling spirit. The high perfected sense illumined, lived. A happy vessel of the inner ray. Each feeling was the eternal's mighty child, and every thought was a sweet burning God. Every thought, sweet burning God. Well, let's imagine. <laughs> Air was a luminous feeling, sound a voice, sunlight a soul's vision, and moonlight is dream. What poetry you see. Sunlight, the soul's vision, moonlight, the dream. In one of his short poems, Shivendu describes the earth as a girl with with moon jam and sun jam in her each lobe. <laughs> in her each lobe. <laughs> Moon James and Sun James in each loop, you see. Sunlight, the soul's vision, moonlight, the dream. On a wide living base of worldless calm, all was a potent and a lucid joy. 
into those highs of spirit went floating up. This is a post Savitri. Her floating up like an upsoaring bird who mounts unseen, voicing to the ascent his throbbing heart of melody till a pause of closing wing comes quivering in his last contented cry and he is silent with his soul discharge, devoured of his heart's burden of delight. So Savitri is climbing up, climbing up, climbing up, he has reached and got relieved, so to say. What a beautiful simile of the climbing bird, you see. Like an upsoaring bird who mounts unseen, you don't see the bird flying up, up, up. It, it can be a very luminous eagle going up like that, you see. She eagle, voicing to the ascent, his throbbing heart of melody. So with the heart of melody, so soaring up, <laughs> melody. Till a pause of closing wings, going up, till the pause of closing wings, comes quivering in his last contented cry. Yes, now I got it. I have reached where I want to reach. Contented cry. And he is silent with his soul discharged. Once it is done, it is silent. Achieved. What has to be gained has been gained. And he is silent with his soul discharged. Delivered of his heart's burden of delight. The burden of delight is given out. Experience mounted and joys colored the breast. You must have seen colored birds, many colors, half a dozen colors on the breast like that. Experience mounted on joys colored brain to inaccessible spheres in spiral flight, going up like that. There, time dwelt with eternity as one. Immense felicity joined, wrapped repose. So this is the first entry of Savitri into those realms of wonder and beauty and joy. What does it mean when a soul is discharged? And he is silent with his soul is discharged. What does it mean? Silent. Uh, and he is silent with his soul so discharged. You have deburdened yourself. Your joy also has been now kind of deburdened. And you become silent. And he is silent with his soul discharged. Means what is soul discharged means you have given out, you have expressed everything what you want to express. And therefore you have become silent. The joy of going, flying, whatever is there, that has been achieved, that has been expressed. After the expression is over, you become silent. No, not yet, not clear. No, comes quivering in his last contented cry, because it's a cry. So, contented cry, happiness is there, because contented. And that has been now achieved, that has been discharged. Discharge means, Kind of now deeper on yourself. You are so happy, so happy that you kind of empty yourself out of that happiness also. That is a state, psychological state also, you see. You don't remain only happy, dancing, dancing, dancing. After that, you kind of fall silent, you see. Silent. This is the, the, that way, psychologically, this is a fairly deep line, you know. He is silent with the soul discharged. Discharged means what? Deburdened. De emptied out yourself full of joy. Expressed fully, completely. The bird, the bird is flying, flying, flying. And ultimately they give me a contented cry. Yes, I have achieved what I want to achieve. The moment it says I have achieved what I want to achieve, it becomes silent. Like an absorbing bird who mounts unseen. Well, I will say this is sheer poetry. So, <laughs> into those highs her spirit went floating up. 
like an absorbing bird of mounts and seas, voicing to the ascent his throbbing heart of melody. Heart, in fact, this is an enjama. Voicing to the ascent his throbbing heart of melody, till a pause of closing wings comes quivering in his last contented cry, and he is silent with his soul discharged. He, of course, stands for the bird. In fact, voicing to the ascent his throbbing heart, that he is his bird. This sheer poetry. <laughs> yeah. Delivered of his heart's burden of delight, so now it is free. And therefore, it has fallen silent. Even the burden is a delight. Huh? Even the, sorry, even the delight is a the, the? Even delight is a burden. Yes. Delivered of his heart, burden of delight. So that delight was there. Okay. I will say rather, this is the quintessence of the truly experienced joy, of extreme joy, you see. Yeah. Of the extreme joy, quintessence of the extreme joy is what we have got to use. What ultimately joy can be, that is what we have here. He is silent to the soul discharged, delivered of his heart's burden of delight. Normally, in our case, we become silent after a lot of weeping and crying and sorrowing and all that sort of a thing. There is some misfortune in the house and then you start weeping, 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 weeping and you fall silent. <laughs> you see. But here is the other, you see, of delight. <laughs> Experience mounted on joy's colored brim to inaccessible spheres in spiral flight. So this is the whole thing. In fact, therefore, the sevanas, the flight of the sevanas is a spiral flight. There, time dwelt with eternity as one. Immense felicity. Join rapt repose. So Savitri is shown the wonders of the world which are there behind the void. All wonders of beauty, joy, happiness, delight, everything is there. And the purpose of showing these wonders, so to say, is O Savitri, be ready to live in those wonders. Here we have entered this wonderful world. Come and stay here. So it is a kind of a Temptation also to Savitri. She has gone there and all these beautiful things are there and whatnot, and she could easily or the prey to the temptation, yes, let me live here. My Satyavan is also there. What does I want? You see. So, so to say, technically speaking, the purpose of this description of wonder is to Check if Savitri is going to fall to this temptation. Is she going to lose the sight or the purpose for which she had taken the birth? That is why this long, elaborate description, a marvelous sun shone, etc., etc., 
and the sunshine is there everywhere. We are day is a dream, day is a vision, and night is a dream. As one drowned in the sea, your splendor and bliss. As one drowned in the sea, your splendor and bliss. Splendor and bliss. See, as one drowned in the sea, your splendor and bliss. This is a line. I could also read it like, as one drowned in the sea, your splendor and a bliss. Splendor and of bliss. Of splendor and of bliss. 3.31. Voyaging through worlds of splendor and of calm. Splendor, uh, worlds of splendor and of calm. Here, see your splendor and bliss. For me? Vertically, both are beautiful. But uh, here, voyaging through worlds of splendor and of calm is politically more appealing than splendor and calm. If you remove off in that line 3.31, it doesn't sound so good. Voyaging to worlds of splendor and calm. See, you know, it doesn't go well. <laughs> that off is important there. Metrically, I will scan this line. Voyaging through worlds, voyaging that is ductile. Long short short. Through words, I am of splendor and of calm. Greek. And again I am. Splendor and of calm. Whereas here, as one drowned in a sea, so I will scan this thing in a different see if you read read now, as one drowned in a sea of splendor and of bliss, that off will not do here. So how alert the poet is to the art of poetry. The phrases are practically the same, but the manipulation of the whole uh, the line depends upon the art of poetry. So this is a very good example of how variation is at the command of the poet himself. Now that is one aspect of poetry. The other aspect is Drowned in a sea of splendor and of bliss. From the point of meaning, would make splendor and bliss two different things. Sea of splendor and sea of bliss. But here, it is one single thing. Splendor is bliss and bliss is sea. Bliss is splendor. The oneness of splendor and bliss. Whereas in the other line, voyaging through worlds of strange voyaging through worlds of splendor and of calm. They are two different things. As one drowned in the sea of splendor and bliss, mute in the maze of these surprising worlds, turning she saw the living knot and souls, he to the charm and found to the delight, and knew him for the same who snares our lives, captured by his terrifying pitiless net, and makes the universe his prison camp, and makes in his immense and vacant world the labor of the stars in circuit vain, and death the end of every human road, and grief and pain, the wages of man's toil. Now, a kind of a contrast is presented. Is it the same fellow whom Savitri is saying all these things, who makes our life a pitiless, who casts a pitiless net, who snares our lives, who makes the universe a prison camp? makes his immense and vacant smile, the labor of the stars, a circuit vain, the stars are moving, moving, moving through years and years and years or whatever you want to call them, you see, vacant smile, the labor of the stars, a circuit vain, and death, the end of every human road, and grief and pain, the wages of man's soul. 
Is it the same fellow who is doing this also? Darling, she saw the living knot, therefore it is not. And so she eat the charm and found the delight and knew him for the same. Yes, she was facing him so far until now like that, and now something different are the same. Is it the same thing? And make the universe his prison camp. One whom her soul had faced at death and night, a sum of all sweetness gathered into his limb and blinded her heart to the beauty of the sun. She was facing him the dark shadow in front of her all along. One whom her soul had faced at death and night, a sum of all sweetness gathered into his limb. So he is nothing but a figure of joy all the while, sweetness. And blinded her heart to the beauty of the sun. Transfigured was the formidable sea. So that formidable sea which is there of death, it is that which is transfigured. That is transfigured. Formidable, of course, because standing there firmly against all of will. See. Now, how careful the yogi poet is in his words. He says, transfigured. He doesn't say transformed. <laughs> he doesn't say transformed. Not yet. Transfigured. Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> What does he say? Say, but I am saying not yet, because end of the chapter it will be transformed, no? <laughs> <laughs> Transfigured was the formidable shape. Really, that's a miracle. That is how he uses every word exactly, with such precision. Now, this transfiguration, is it a real transfiguration? Or a change of point of view. He wears another form. His huh? form has changed. Form, there is no question of form here. Is it, you follow what I'm saying? I mean, is it change of our uh, way of looking at things which has changed and therefore it looks something different? Or really he is transformed, transfigured? You have now different vision. You are looking at things from a different point of view. And therefore you see now in a different light. So until now whom you were seeing was death. But now you are seeing him as somebody else. Is it your vision which has changed or is it that person who has changed? What do you say? Vision has changed. Vision has changed. So it depends now, then uh, it is all Maya then for us, you see. That is rather, <laughs> that will knock away the entire reality and the content and the meaning of this whole thing. He has to be transformed, he has to be different. It is not only my vision, my way of looking at things which has changed. It is not my sight which has now got altered, no. That would not mean anything. The concreteness of all the aspects of death, of ignorance, of consciousness, of void, that will get lost. So it's not just the vision which has changed. The occult fact behind that thing is, things have changed. Therefore the vision has changed. Therefore the vision has changed. Savitri was not able to see him until now in that manner. Only when he has vanished into the void, suddenly she sees something different. True or not? <laughs> no, I think we'll have to still brood on that. Whether it, it is not Savitri's vision which has changed. Of course, vision has changed. But behind that vision, there has been some action which has also occurred, occult action which has occurred. And it is that occult action which has now brought about the entire change. Not only the outlook, but also 
in the very occult nature of things, in the very occult nature of things, it's not only the outlook has changed. Transfigured, what the farmer will say. So that transfigured has in that sense a double sense, you see. His darkness and his sad destroying might, abolishing forever and disclosing the mystery of his high and violent deeds, a secret splendor rose, revealed to sight, where once the vast embodied void had stood. His darkness and his destroying might, they were there all along. Abolishing, what are they doing? He's destroying my sad, destroying might, abolishing forever and disclosing the mystery of his high and violent deeds, a secret splendor. There now, the secret splendor, which is there in him, it is that which has come into revelation, revealed to sight. So there is a double change now. Because this change has taken place, therefore, the sight is able to see that change. Where one, the vast embodied void has to, embodied void, that is death. When Savitri presented herself there, then to meet her, the void had taken that form of the death and presented to her, embodied. Where one, vast embodied void has to, night, the dim mass had grown a wonderful face. It has to grow. It was it had it had, it was a mask until now. Now it has become a wonderful face, you see. It also death and night, you see. Face as death and night. So embodied night, that is death. Dim night, wonderful face. The vague infinity was slain, whose gloom had outlined from the terrible unknown the obscure, disastrous figure of a god. Fled was the error that armed the hands of green and lighted the ignorant dull, whose hollow deeds had nothing, had, had given to nothingness a dreadful voice. Fled was the error. We have been mistaking all along. That is our error. It is that error. No, but that error is not only the question of only sight or experience or subjective. It is also a real thing, very concrete thing, a definite thing. It has a sort of an occult hold on us, on our activities. It is not only a kind of a vision of our error. Let was the error that armed the hands of grief. So why? Why grief is powerful? Because we are under the sway of error. Arm, hands of grief are armed by error. Hands of grief are armed by error. And lighted the ignorant gull whose hollow deeps had given to nothingness a dreadful voice. So that is the error. And light is the ignorant girl whose hollow deeds. So that is the abyss. Savitri has gone beyond now that crossed that abyss. You see. And light is the ignorant girl whose hollow deep had given to nothingness a dreadful voice. So actually it is, it is that error which made the void dreadful. So it is not just a question of only standpoint of seeing that. There is a occult, occult presence, occult content in that also. As when before the, sorry, as when before the eye that wakes in sleep it opened the somber binding of a book. So you open in the sleeve and see the somber binding of a book, the dark book. Illumined letterings are seen, which kept 
a golden braid of thought inscribed within me. So the book was there until now it was all concealed, but now something else. Illumined litterings are seen which kept a golden blaze of thought inscribed then a marvelous form responded to her gaze. So as if a new book has opened out now in front of Savitri. What until now was the book describing the soul of the earth with sorrow, suffering, mortality and all that thing. What she was reading that thing until now. Now suddenly she sees uh, the book of the bliss of the earth. Bliss of the earth. Yeah. Illumined litterings are seen which kept a golden blade of thought inscribed within. There is beauty, there is joy, there is power, there is love, there is sweetness in that book. A marvelous form responded to her gaze. So that form, now that transfigured person. Whose sweetness justified lies the blindest of pain. Whose sweetness justified lies the blindest of pain. <laughs> it is because of his sweetness that the pain of this world is acceptable. Justified. Now he says, whose sweetness justified lies blindest pain. Milton's paradise lost begins with the justification of God's way to man. It is a justification of God's way to man. Here, in the paradise of Savitri, we have got now this figure there justifying his presence, justifying the problem of this world, blindest pain. Justify the ways of man to God, you see. It is how the opening passage of Paradise Lost tells us. I am writing this poem, Milton says, Paradise Lost, in the beginning itself to justify the ways of man to God. So that justification had that echo to paradise laws, what Milton says, you see. <laughs> the word justify. For sweetness justified lies blindest pain. All nature's struggle was its easy prize. The universe and the agony seemed worthwhile. <laughs> yes, let me accept the difficulty. Let me accept the agony. Let me accept the torture, the pain. Because behind all that, there is a sweetness. The universe and its agony seemed worthwhile. So don't complain. So this is a message we should go straight to Savitri's mother, Malavi. You see, she was shouting and crying and she had gone into tantrums. The universe and its agony seemed worthwhile. As if worthwhile how as if in the choric calyx of a flower, the flower is there, the choric is there, the calyx is there, it's covering. So it is that which is now disclosed like a flower. As if the choric calyx of a flower, aerial, visible on music's waves, a lotus of light petaled ecstasy took shape out of the tribal's heart of the that is poetry. <laughs> How the sweetness disclosed the choric calyx, choric musical, you see. The calyx is the, the outer covering of the bud, you see that thing, you see, calyx, of the sepals. Calyx is the sepals, you see. As if the choric calyx of a flower, aerial, visible on music's waves, so you see them on the waves of music, you see. A lotus of white petaled ecstasy took shape out of the tremulous heart of things. Lotus petaled, white petaled lotus. So it is the Padma lotus. 
in a verse, this sweetness, this marvelous form, this golden blaze, it is that lotus, that Patma, as you decorate this year poetry, as if the choric calyx of a flower, aerial, visible on music's waves, a lotus of light petaled ecstasy to shave out of the tremulous heart of things. Was that all necessary to say? When you have said, whose sweetness justifies lies blindest pain, and then the poet is in a mood of ecstasy, he is expanding, letting himself go. Not only that, he has to justify what he has said. The universe and its agony seemed worthwhile. To justify that, he is writing four lines. Because no more the torment and the star, the evil shattered behind nature's mask. There are no more the dark pretense of hate, the cruel actors of love's altered face. Actors stress, trust. Actually, actors is a word which is used in prosody. In sorry, in, in, in language where you lay stress on words, on syllables. Ictus is the stress which goes on a given syllable. Syllable. There was no more the torment under the star. Now here you can say torment under the star. So the stress is on tor. The ictus is on tor. The stress. In Prasadi, where the stress is going on, that way. the cruel, the cruel actress on love's altered face. Now, cruel actress, yeah, when there is sweetness, then it becomes cruel also. You love somebody so sweetly, so dearly, so intensely, as if you are getting crushed by it. <laughs> The cruel ictus and love's hearted face. The evil shattered behind nature's mask. Haste was a grip of a dreadful armor strive. A ruthless love intent only to possess. That is what Namila, only to possess. Intent only to possess. That is the character of us. Has here replayed the sweet original God. Forgetting the will to love that gave it birth, the passion to lock itself in and to unite, it would swallow all into one lonely cell, devouring the soul that had made its own by suffering and annihilation of pain, punishing the unwillingness of the one, the angry, sorry, punishing one, the one, angry, with the refusals of the world, passionate to take, but knowing not how to give. That is what happens in the case of intense love. Now here, forgetting the will to love, will to love, this is represent of Nietzsche's phrase, will to be, will to become. Nietzsche's phrase will to be, will to become, will to love. She, she went to has here, the poet has adopted Nietzsche. Forgetting the will to love that gave it birth, the passion to lock itself in and to unite, it would swallow all into one lonely cell. That is what it do, swallow all this. That is what the temptation is there for. See? Now it is this will to love, forgetting the will to love. He is the transfigured, he is now become the tempter. Forgetting the will to love. He wants to kind of absorb everything into love. Savitri, you have done wonderful to come and stay here. That is what it means. 
Death's somber cowl was cast from nature's brow. There lightened on her the goddess lurking love. Cast from nature's brow, there lightened on her the goddess lurking love. I don't know. This her is for Savitri or for nature? This somber cowl was cast from nature's brow. They are lightened on her, the goddess lurking love. But possibly it is more Savitri, her. <laughs> they are lightened on her, the goddess lurking love. All grace and glory and all divinity were here collected in a single form. All worshipped eyes looked through his from one face. He bore all goddess in his grandiose limbs. All goddess in his grandiose limbs. Pardon? He is death. He, he, he is, is the, the God, the death. He is death. Got it. Well, got it. Got it, death. death, same. This stand here. He is death. Death's somber cowl was cast from nature's brow. They are lightened on her, the Godhead. That is death. Lurking love. But this her, I would still say it is more for in the context of Savitri than nature. All worshipped eyes looked through his from one face. He bore all Godheads in his grandiose limbs. So everybody is there now in him. Cowl was cast from nature's brow. Okay. And after their lightness on her, her could be the nature. Yeah, yeah the, well, the, the, but you see, this is more universal than that. Yeah. I, I know, I mean, this is one single sentence. Yeah, yeah, it is a single. But you see, this allows, although the contextually it will go to immediately connected get connected with nature. But if you see by itself, they are lightened on how the God is lurking love. Is gone. So the, what that would mean is that. It is nature who is now seeing this lurking love, not Savitri. Yeah, yeah. This somber cowl was cast from nature's brow. You see, the whole point is. Why suddenly nature is brought into picture here? There is no context here earlier. There is no context immediately available here. They are lightened on her, the goddess lurking. See, this nature appears rather abruptly here, without immediate context. All glory, all grace and glory, and all divinity were here collected in a single form. All worshipped eyes looked through. See, this nature's sudden appearance has to be then linked up with the will to love. That's the only connection which is possible between the appearance of nature and will to love. All grace and glory and all, oh, I'm sorry, all grace and glory and all divinity were here collected in a single form. All worshipped eyes looked through his from one face. He bore the goddess in his grandiose name. Now, this one, uh, 
reminds us of Savitri's experience when she is about to discover her soul. What we did last time, earlier, long ago. 125.35. Savitri is on the verge of discovering her soul. She is going from place to place in the inner chambers, what we did last time. A sealed identity within her woke in Savitri. She knew herself the beloved of the Supreme. These gods and goddesses were he and she. The mother was she of beauty and delight. The world in Brahma's vast creating class. The world fusions on Almighty Shiva's lap. The master and the mother of all lives, watching the worlds that twin the God had made, and Krishna and Radha forever entwined in bliss. The adorer and adored self lost and won. All here, all bore, sorry, he bore all goddess in his grandiose limbs. So all these people who are seeing, which Savitri is seeing, gods and goddesses, mother of beauty, world, world and Brahma, world fusions and Shiva, Shiva and Parvati, Vishnu and Lakshmi, Brahma and Saraswati, they are all one. Uh, he bore all goddess in his grandiose limbs. That is the kind of experience Savitri had in her inner soul. And she sees now here in front of her. How, how can he have all the godheads in him? Every, every, every godhead is in him. How come he is the supreme. Who is he then? He is the supreme. Death, death. Ah. Death? It, is, it is the supreme himself who is death. Who you are seeing as death is the Supreme Himself, whom you are seeing until now as death. It is Supreme Himself. All grace and glory and all divinity. You say it is all divinity. Were here collected in a single form. All worshipped eyes looked through his, from one face, he bore all goddess in his grandiose limb. An ocean of spirit dwelt within, intolerant and invincible in joy, a flood of freedom and transcendent to bliss, into immortal lines of beauty rose. In him the fourfold being bore crown, See, this is what we start seeing. <laughs> yeah. Poor, poor being. We are going to Upanishad there, see. We will take up this next time. Can I ask one question about death being the supreme? Because there were those four beings and they turned into the opposite. But death and falsehood are two different beings there. Different, different me? Yes. How? Oh. So there, there is the suffering, and then there is the death, and then there is a lot of falsehood, and then uh, we. That is the mother story of cosmic creation. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> now yes. behind yes. all that, behind all that, this death is different than mother's death. <laughs> this death is different than mother's. Death. Yes. <laughs> but how can it be different? Well, it is. Death is death, it, no? She is narrating in the form of a story. It's not only all that. And she is not giving the full description of that thing. She is only giving a part of the story. Oh, that? <laughs> yeah. no, that. no. Really? Yeah. Why doesn't she say that? Because she, she says that it is in the universal manifestation. Now, this is beyond the universal manifestation. She is not asked any question about that. She has not told about that. You have to see only in that context. Hello. You have to see that thing only in the context of universal manifestation. Mother story. Everything must die. Stars are dying. Yeah. Samson so she, she says, 
in the cosmic manifestation it happened they separated from the soul that is a thing which happened much 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 later in the process of manifestation and after that what is going to happen she has not narrated she has not asked No, I think we should not mix up uh, the you know, figure of death with the story in which mother is using the word death. It's not that. No, it's not that. No, 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 no. That is all right up to a certain manner, in a certain manner to understand a graph, a certain thing like a story, a small bit of it, narrative. But they are four, and they change, yeah. or they disappear. Yeah. That's true, no? Yeah. Two, two, the, yeah, I mean, there are four. One has converted, one has uh, disappeared. Two are still there. Yes. But that is in the cosmic manifestation. Now, this is something different. This is, I would say, the, the, the deeper than that. In fact, nobody had asked the mother the question about those four powers, death, she, she, she is talking death in what context? She is talking death, life became death. This is something more than that. This is something more than that. Uh, life became death. In conscience, became, sorry, the, the consciousness became inconscient. Bliss became, so life became death. That is in a certain context, you see. This is something now beyond that. She spoke about the four asura. We are talking about four asura. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we can understand that this different, this death yeah. is not the asura. No, this death is different than that. Yeah. That you have to see that. You see. In fact, I told you earlier also, uh, the figure of death which we have got in the Indian tradition, Yama, Yamaraj, Dharmaraj, he is depicted in two ways, he is cruel, very harsh, very stern. At the same time, he is the upholder of the law of the right. He is the supreme. He is the son, he is the son of the son himself. Vivaswata. Vivaswata is the sun god. So it is he who is described in two forms. In the Vyasa story, which we had read earlier, Savitri says, you look to be very beautiful, very impressive, and at the same time, very stern and all that thing. She sees both the aspects in the figure of Yama, they are benign, beautiful, and at the same time, harsh and difficult. Now, these two aspects are being separated out here. When you see on this side, he is very cruel, very harsh, and all that thing. When you see on the other side, he is very benign, very beautiful, very generous, that kind of thing. Dharmaraj. See, Dharmaraj, upholder of the law of the right of Dharma. So, both the aspects are present in the figure of Yama. In the Vedic story, there is a very beautiful description. See, these, these, these you have to see in many contexts. Not only mother story is a small narrative, anyway. And you have to limit the implications of the narrative only to that part alone. In the Rigveda, there is a shloka. There, the shloka says that Yama, Vivaswata, Vivaswata, he is the son of Vivaswan, son, son god. He is sitting under the Palasha tree and drinking the wine of immortality is shown there. Now, that is a very, very beautiful description in the sense that he is sitting under the Palasha tree. Palasha means, uh, what do you call, the claim of the forest. That's the common name, you see. The claim of the forest, or what the mother calls, the significance of that claim, Mother says, beginning of the supramental realization. Claim of the forest, 
mother's significant beginning or the supramental realization. Now, this man is sitting under this tree and drinking wine there. What does that signify? The beginning of supramental realization. The Vedic sloka says very clearly, very beautifully, that he is drinking wine under the supalasha tree. Supalasha tree. Palasha means this, this tree, playing with the forest. You got that, yeah. He is drinking wine there and, and that is the beginning of the supplemental realization. So it is one, it is he who is really giving you that realization. So you have to see, if you see from this side, he looks very really dark, cruel, harsh, etc, etc. The moment that error is removed, you see all those beautiful, nice aspects of it. All those beautiful, nice aspects of it. Super large. No, so mother's story is all right up to a certain point in a certain context. Don't don't extend it beyond that, you see. Because she was not asked any further questions in the context here like that. So so you can't hold her responsible for that. And she also says that that is the story she got from Theo. I don't remember now. <laughs> is there in the agenda? <laughs> And she says that uh, she she had to live with two of them, yeah. with Theo and yeah. with uh, no, Paul Shah. <laughs> but she also said that they are not Asura, they are emanations. Yeah, Theo yeah. yeah. and uh, Paul Shah. Yeah. But uh, finally, finally, you know, with what 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 tremendous respect she always speaks about Theo. Yeah. Yeah. Everywhere you see that. She never saw, as I said, even a single word uh, which is derogatory of him. Not even a single word. But of course, for Paul Richard, she... <laughs> yeah, she yeah. So she, she spoke very highly about Theo in that sense, you see. Yeah. And the fact that um, she had come in direct contact with them. You see, it is a different. people are not asked these questions to her. In the context of Savitri and all that, you see. So, and you, you are troubling me. She wants to know. No, I will only say that. I mean, you have to see mother's story in a certain context and don't, don't go beyond that. She also says very, very definitely that according to Theo, who came first, falsehood came first or death came first? She poses that question, you see. And she says according to Theo, it is falsehood. Who is the cause of death? And she says that according to Shevindu, it is death who is the cause of falsehood. Yeah. So, the, but now those questions are not asked beyond that afterwards. Mm -hmm. So, the, this four four being, I think we'll say we'll we'll take up next time. Then we'll start with that. An ocean is spirit dwelt within. Ocean is spirit dwelt within. Now, it is the description of this ocean is spirit. As the four four being that will follow. In the rest of the section, you see, a flood of freedom and transcendent bliss into immortal lines of beauty rose. 